Welcome to IdeaMix Performance and Wellness, where world-leading coaches and scientists explain how their research can help you achieve your personal and professional goals faster. Hi, it's Sam Jayanti, co-founder and CEO of IdeaMix Coaching. Coaching's played an important role in my life. It's helped me through my journey to become a powerful leader, mother, and wife. IdeaMix coaches help you increase your self-awareness, improve your problem-solving skills, and evolve your habits to achieve your goals. All things I'm grateful to have learned and done through my own coaching journey. Our easy one-minute assessment matches you with an IdeaMix coach that best fits your needs and values. Each IdeaMix coach is vetted and experienced and helps clients map and achieve their wellness, professional, and business goals. If you or someone you know could benefit from coaching, visit our website at www.theideamix.com. We also know that not everyone can invest in coaching right now, and that's why we provide free coaching in our Coach Shorts episodes. If you think someone you know would benefit from it, please share our podcast with them. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. Today, we're excited to have Professor Francis Fry join us on the show. By any measure, Francis is unusual. She's a professor, advisor, author, strategist, TED speaker, and spent 2017 at Uber on a leave of absence to lead leadership and strategy for several thousand employees in a company contending with rapid growth and a quickly evolving culture. In her day job, she's a professor of technology and operations management at Harvard Business School with a research focus on the intersection of leadership, operations, strategy, and culture. She's also the author of a viral TED Talk, How to Build and Rebuild Trust. And I unfortunately did not have the privilege of being taught by Francis as an MBA student at Harvard 100 years ago, but I remember a close friend of mine who did study with her describe her as singular and legendary. So I could go on and on, but I'd rather that Francis and I show you rather than tell you about her work in the rest of this podcast. Francis, welcome to IDMX Coaching. Well, that's the best introduction I have ever had. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will send it to you so that you uh, can I would love, use it I would, whenever you want. And then I will send it to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So I wanted to start us off, Francis, with just a few really quick questions. So simple kind of yes or no answers. And we'll dive into a lot of those topics later in our conversation. So number one, do most companies, in your experience, put service at the heart of their business? No. Do most leaders understand how to empower their teams? No. Is trust the single most important element in the success of a company? Yes. Number four, do most leaders, in your experience, exhibit the self-awareness necessary to lead effectively? No. And last, if you had to pick just one activity that you enjoy doing in your spare time, what is it? Watching the deer eat on video in a beautiful deer sanctuary up in Maine. It okay, is mesmerizing. I was expecting. <laughs> it's mesmerizing and amazing. And I do it in the middle of the night when I have spare time. And I just love it. Brownfield, Maine. It's amazing. It's called the Deer Pantry. Wow. Okay. That's very cool. I'm definitely going to check that out. <laughs> um, so, Francis, in an article that you wrote in back in 2020 in Management Today, you described your time at Uber fixing what was then a very toxic culture. And you talked about encountering 3,000 managers who had been really strong individual contributors were then elevated to be managers with very little training, and the result that they were very poorly equipped to lead and manage during a period of hyper growth at the company, and a culture of sort of a lack of focus on developing individuals to be effective in their roles, right? There was maybe no time. But this is such a common problem at companies more broadly we encounter it daily in our coaching business because the skills that get you to that leadership role are not the same skills that you then need to manage a team effectively. So you've had these encounters at Uber and you've advised lots of companies on the same issue. What's the underlying structural problem in your view? 
Uh, the structural problem is, I think, to find out why is it that people aren't able to perform well, and it's not their fault. <laughs> so whatever the obstacle is, and it's only ever like one of three, but whatever the obstacle is, let's just systematically address it as opposed to lament it that it's not there. So if, if we take radical responsibility for the success of our employees, we will be able to get there. And, and the, the three obstacles, and this is in the language of a colleague of mine, Ryan Buells, but they either don't have the capability to do it, which was the case at Uber, mm -hmm. um, or they don't have the motivation, or they don't have the license or permission. Whichever one it is, address it. It's, I find that like my no answers to all of your early questions, I didn't, I'm a crazy optimist. I, if I could say a longer answer, it's no and it can be readily taught. So everything you asked for, we can teach it, but we're not born knowing it. I like to think of it as the secret memos on how to do it. And we just haven't had wide enough distribution on the secret memos on how to do these things. And so I feel like that's what I did when I went to Uber is I provided the secret memos to how to manage. And these amazing people that they didn't know how to manage makes them amazing people. <laughs> Yeah, it's so true. I mean, you know, these skills are learned, right, in most cases. I mean, maybe there's a minority of people who just sort of either know these things or develop them as they go along. But most of the time, they're learned skills and they're very teachable, as you've identified. Um, and yet organizations fail to create a structure and a mechanism to actually shepherd people through these career transitions and evolutions, right? And, and, and so sort of, in a sense, set them up to fail. Was that different in an Uber context? Was it common to a lot of the other contexts that you've seen? I mean, obviously you knew that context much more intimately since you were in there. Well, I, I think that in hyper growth, it's particularly tempting to underinvest in development. Mm -hmm because you're like scrambling to do other things and you think, well, the ROI of taking advantage of that next dollar of revenue is more important and I'll get to development later, right? I'll just, I'll sequence it to later. <clears throat> Organizations that we see that really benefit, <clears throat> excuse me, that really benefit, they do a couple of things, but one is they get very efficient at the development. So development needn't take a very long time. Like you went to the Harvard Business School for two years, right? Yeah. So that is a very long time, but you to learn things that are gonna last a lifetime. Yeah. Organizations, to train somebody from going from an individual contributor to a manager, I think that if you, well, we did it in 30 days. Right. Um, and fully equipped people in 30 days. And it wasn't even their primary responsibility in 30 days. That was back in 2017. I think we've gotten much more efficient at doing it now. And with AI, we can get even more efficient at doing it. But what most people think is that they don't have good models to do it. They think it takes a long time and it's less important than getting the next dollar. Right. What I like to say is you're going to get the next dollar, but it's going to blow up in like a little while. So like, let's do this, mm -hmm. solve it once so that you'll have it forever. But I understand the pressures that these organizations are under. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So another of the areas of your research have focused on service businesses and you distinguish them very clearly from product-based businesses. Would you explain for our audience that distinction that you draw? Sure. And that distinction was born out of, I, when I went and got my PhD, it was in operations and information management at Wharton. And so if I take the operations management part of it, up until that point, the study of operations by academics was entirely in manufacturing. Hmm. It was entirely in what we would jokingly say, things you can drop on your foot. <laughs> and if you can drop something on your foot, physics applies, you can't pretend it doesn't. I was obsessed with service organizations for a couple of reasons. One, it's like well north of three quarters of most economies. Mm -hmm. um, and it had been understudied. And you can't drop it on your foot. And people can seduce themselves into thinking that physics doesn't apply. So you can, the lessons that I came up with for service organizations, most of them also apply to manufacturing, 
but you couldn't have pretended they didn't. Right. So I'll, I'll give you one example of that, my favorite example of that. In manufacturing, we know that you can't be great at everything. Like cost, quality, and speed trade off against each other. Why? Because, you know, if something's going to be heavy, it can't also, you know, it can't also be light. These two things trade off against each other. Right. I see so many service businesses that think it can be heavy and light at the same time, that think you can overcome trade offs just by sheer will. So I was studying the understudied, one, because it was so vast, and two, because we were seducing ourselves into all of these, you know, wacky things. And so if we could just provide common sense to these contexts, we could make a big difference. That's a that's a great way to explain it. I think the 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 sort of tangibility is is such a key point, right? Because I, I totally agree with you that the the sort of delusion that you can just will something into being, even though they're very contradictory forces competing with each other, you know, it's sort of an easy delusion. Only exists in services because in manufacturing, like quite literally, physics applies. <laughs> yeah. So right. So, you know, service businesses are super interesting to us. Most of the companies we work with are either in the professional, uh, they're either companies in professional services or they're individuals working in professional services businesses, right? In an HBR article that you wrote in 2008, you talked about the four elements that service businesses have to get right, right, in order to be successful. Tell our listeners a little bit about these four elements, because I found them fascinating. And, sure. and why getting them right is not a one size fits all, because there is such a diversity of service companies in the end. Yeah. So the first one, which we called service offering when we wrote this, then this is back in 2013. I, I like to joke that it, it would almost get a classic car license plate. It's <laughs> almost that old uh, and still holds true today. Um, but this is the one that in order to be great, you have to be bad. And so the example, the manufacturing example or for the parallel we always use is the MacBook Air. Best in class at weight, worst in class at physical features when in, in the dawn, when it had, it had recently come out when, when we started talking about that. And service organizations just, they will talk about what they want to be great at and they will be embarrassed but they want to, by what they're bad at. And mm -hmm. we're like, no, 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 you have to be equally articulate at both and understand that the reason I don't have physical features is so that I can be best in class at weight. Like one is in service of the other, both are equally important. So that's the first part. If you don't get that part right, it's going to be hard to make up for it with everything else I'm about to say. So that's the most important thing. What because we call you're the saying it's sort of, it's an articulation and an acknowledgement of, yes. of it effectively. Yes, because otherwise, when you're not looking, I'm going to get better at the things we're designed to be bad at, which mm -hmm. means I'm going to get worse at the things that we were trying to win at. And mm -hmm. so we're going to play an infinite game of whack-a-mole. And we're going to lead to exhausted mediocrity, which is what I tragically see in way too many people and in way too many organizations. And it's not out of laziness. It's out of constantly trying to make up for what we're bad at, as opposed to realizing that is precisely the fuel of what we're great at. So that's the first part of the four things. Once you have that, the second part is, and this is particularly true for services, is a funding me mechanism. And that is you have to make sure that you get paid. Now, of course, you have to get paid. Usually for products, you pay once and that's it. For in services, and what we often do is that we're tempted when the customer says, oh, I would like this. We're tempted to give it to them for free. Right. What we refer to as gratuitous service. The problem is if I give you something for free now, I'm going to have to charge you later. And what's going to happen when I charge you later is I'm going to raise the price without raising the features and you're going to hate me. Mm -hmm. So I did something out of love now that's going to come out of you're going to end up hating me for later. But we do things because for the for free all the time. So if I go to an organization, I say, tell me all of your improvement ideas for the customer. Let's say they list 50. I'll say, OK, and how many will the customer pay extra for? 40 of them come off the list. I was like, stop working on those. Mm -hmm. Let's let's work on ones for which we have a reliable funding mechanism. Let's work on ones for which people aren't going to hate us later for when we ultimately do have to end up getting paid for it. So that's the the funding mechanism part is a real is a real thing. That's number two. The third one is what we were alluding to earlier. We call the employee management system. 
and we titled the chapter in Uncommon Service, it's never your employee's fault. <laughs> and here it's, have you set your employees up for success? Have you reliably set them up for success? And here's what we know. Selection, development, promotion, retention, the employee life cycle, those four things have to be mutually reinforcing. So if I hire inexperienced people, I better give them a lot of training. If I hire experienced people, I better give them a job design with lots of license in it. Like it's not that there's better, it's not, oh, hire experienced, hire inexperienced. I don't care which one you do. I just know that the rest of the parts of the employee life cycle and the rest of the parts of the employee management system better be mutually reinforcing. Yeah. So have we taken radical responsibility for the success of our employees? That's the employee management system. Mm. And then the fourth part is the customer management system. In services, customers can play an operating role. So it's not just that the employee behavior influences quality, but the customer behavior might. So healthcare, for example. Yeah. How I behave as a patient influences the overall outcome of my health. It's not like a doctor can just deliver my health. I co-produce it. Well, that's true in most services, and it's not true in most manufacturing. When somebody right. manufactures Tide detergent, it just is as good as it is, regardless of what I do. So we have to select, develop, train, and retain um, customers the same way we do employees. So there's a, there's a parallel customer management system. Those are the four things a service business must get right. Yeah. And, and I think especially your point about this idea of managing customers is so often lost on service businesses, right? Because either in the beginning stages, they want any customer that comes in the door. And later on, it's because growth is happening relatively quickly. And, and so there's no time, in a sense, to distinguish between the desirable customers and the undesirable ones. But as you said, if they're co-creating the outcome, unlike in manufacturing, that choice of customer is incredibly important. Incredibly important. And, and I liked how you said it. We often say that we're looking for customer, we're looking for revenue with a pulse. <laughs> And we, we have to be more discerning than that, just like we are for our employees. If customer behavior matters, we have to be discerning. But that is an awfully courageous act for most organizations, but an absolutely essential act. Yeah, absolutely necessary. And, and, and I think, you know, more on this employee management idea um, later. So we'll come back to that. So I want to shift gears a little bit now to talk about trust. Yeah. The loss of trust surrounds us. Consumers have lost trust in products. Professionals have less trust in their organizations. Citizens feel less trust in their government and institutions. And even though it's only in some ways 30 plus years since the end of the Cold War, right, when capitalist democracies became the clear winning model, liberal democracy itself now is sort of in question because of this, this kind of loss of trust. In your TED talk on rebuilding trust, which I loved, um, and, and that was based on your experiences at Uber, you talked about encountering an organization that was literally on fire because of this lack of trust. And I would love you to please share with our listeners that finding and, and, and sort of what catalyzed it in your mind as you went in there. Um, and, and, and how you sort of, you know, in a sense, alighted on this idea that the loss of trust was so deep and institutional and that really you were going to work to kind of bring this back, right? Yeah. So the way I got to Uber, I think, might be useful to just shed a little light on. When I was asked if I would come out and meet the then CEO of Uber, I said no. And it was a former student that asked me, and she said, I understand you have an opinion based on what you've read in the newspaper. He's a different person than that. As a favor to me, will you come and meet him? I, of course, said yes, because once a student, always a student. Um, and, and I flew across the country. That I would never do again. <laughs> but I flew across the country to have a relatively short meeting, the meeting which lasted three days. 
I postponed my flight home five times because the meeting just kept going on. And so we talked about everything. I got to raise every single issue because Anne and I, co-author and wife, um, we help good people do hard things. Mm -hmm. But we take our responsibility to help good people very, very seriously. And I didn't think he was a good person by everything I read. Well, at the end of the three days, I was absolutely certain he was a good person. Mm -hmm. And he was very inexperienced in what he had done. For example, the last company he led had eight people. Right. When I got to Uber, they had 13,000 people <laughs> and were one of the most successful startups of, you know, by, by certain measures. Yeah. And so he was out over his skis in a couple of areas, which makes him human um in in that regard yeah. he also wanted help the places where he was over his skis in particular leadership and strategy were two places where i just happened to be a really good fit so not only did i think he was a good person but the unique things i can do it just it was hand in glove right and so that's how i got there was to to do that and when i looked around at the problems the problems were very consistent, regardless of which stakeholder it was. So the employees had lost trust. The regulators had lost trust. Riders had lost trust. Investors, drivers, like literally every constituent in some ways had the same problem. And to me, from my operations mind, that's a much easier problem to solve than if everybody had a different problem. Right. So when I got there and I looked at it, I was like, I'm just seeing the same thing manifest again and again and again. And so what we did is tested whether or not teaching people about trust mm -hmm. and teaching them the remedies to overcome broken trust would work. And it worked like at an exhilarating pace. So you went in, in a sense, with this concept of trust you know, as part of your research and thinking. Well, uh, well before I got there, so before yeah. I said yes, I had to test whether or not, so I probably taught 1,500 of the three of the 13,000 people before I said yes. Okay. Because I was like, I got to see if the way in which I communicate works. And I very quickly early on realized trust is what I should be teaching them mm. to see if that's it. So I started hearing about it right away and then I started teaching it. So I had taught 1,500 people about trust and it was being absorbed at a beautiful rate. And then I was like, there's something I can do here. And and even though the loss of trust in many ways would was attributable to different reasons depending on the different stakeholders, right? It was almost always the same reason. Okay. So say more. So about. if trust if trust consists of you're more likely to trust me if you experience authenticity, logic, and empathy, it was almost always an empathy wobble. Mm. It was almost always I was so self-distracted in myself. Yeah that I would be okay with collateral damage of you. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. That was, com that was, I mean, in a sense, it was dictated by company culture. I, I think the company culture was, and which was, you know, Travis would often say, like, he was diagnosed as I am, as an empathy wobbler, which is if we're going to lose trust, it's probably for empathy. And mm -hmm. as a very successful founder, CEO, his wobble became the cultural wobble. Right, of the entire I, And I see that all the time. Yeah. So is that, would you say of the three elements that you just outlined, is that the most, is that the one you see most commonly? It is, it is. And um, I was just with an organization uh, this morning and 50% had empathy wobble and 25% had authenticity and 25% had logic. What I see more commonly is 60% empathy, yeah, 30% logic, and then 20% authenticity. Okay, super interesting. So it's by far the lion's share. Yeah. So trust lies at the heart of leadership, right? As you've, as you've just identified. Um, and the teams at Uber had no trust in their managers and the managers in turn had no understanding of how to lead or trust in their leaders. 
I, you know, I recently came across a CEO who basically described his leadership style to me as well, what I would characterize, I guess, as super micromanagey, right? He sort of described how <laughs> every day at work starts with a two-hour team meeting and every day ends with a sort of one-hour team meeting. And, and that's how he kind of runs the organization. Wow. That's an organization built to be a hobby, not a, not yeah. a company. <laughs> I, I mean, totally, no disrespect, but totally. that can't it's scale not, in your absence. Not scalable. Yeah. 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 And... You know, and I, I we had this conversation about his style was such a clear impediment. And and we talked a little bit about, okay, this is what you do at your company. Like, what do you do at home with your family? Like, how does that work? Right. Nice. Nice. And he and, and you know, same tactic and sort of refusal to accept that it should be or could be different. Right. Yeah. And not long after that. I mean, in a very sad way, the problem with his leadership style became very evident to him in a home context, in fact, not in the work context initially. And it was that moment where he sort of, you know, realized that this wasn't working and it wasn't going to work kind of going forward. And, you know, they'd ended up in sort of a really bad place. Why do you feel so many leaders struggle to empower their teams? And, and and equally, a lot of these behaviors show up at home too, right? Yeah, with, yeah. With the family. And and so you know what that experience is like. And, and, and you see a mirror image of those behaviors in both spheres, in a sense. And, and why do you think it's such a struggle? Yeah. So I'll... Uh... I'll tell you how I overcame the struggle as maybe a way to show what the struggle is, which yeah. is, and I overcame it in a parenting context, but to your point, it can be with partners, parents, employees, it's all, um, which is when I heard Carol Dweck uh, say, there are two ways to parent yeah. and one of them is the right way. As an insecure parent who was sure I was doing things wrong, I just didn't know specifically what I was doing wrong, she had my attention. And she said, you can either prepare the path for the child or you can prepare the child for the path. Mm. So many of us are preparing the path for the child. So many of us are weed whacking yeah. out of love. So we're not micromanaging out of anger. We're micromanaging out of love. What we fail to realize is that we're making people reliant on our presence. And what we want to do is be preparing the child for any path. Yeah. What we want to do is to be preparing people for our absence as opposed to making them reliant on our presence. Yeah. Building Micro resilience. Right. And micromanaging is requiring that people can only do excellence in our presence. Mm -hmm. When if we just put on a different lens, give this context, I could fix it for you or tell you how to fix it, or I could interact with you in such a way that you will be able to do things like this and beyond in my absence. It's a whole different pedagogy associated with it. Yeah. I, I think we all have to have the equivalent of that light bulb moment. Am I preparing you for my presence, making you reliant on me, or am I preparing you for my absence? And the moment we realize we're preparing people for our absence, that's when empowerment becomes one of the most beautiful things in the world. Yeah, it's so true. I, I also, you know, think back to I spent some time at Palantir. And one of the things that used to amuse me a fair amount was that there were a lot of old economy companies that would come through not just Palantir, but sort of a bunch of companies in the valley. And they would come on these, they call them innovation tours, like, you know, trying to figure out what is it that creates this culture of innovation in the valley? And, you know, why are we not able to replicate it? And and, and and the reason was like, you didn't even have to come here. You know, it was super simple. It was if you approach running your business from a position of risk aversion, where you're all, where the culture is, don't screw it up, then that's what you get, right? Whereas if you- Incremental. <laughs> right. Yeah. And if you approach your business from the position of, hey, we trust you to take some risks, we understand that mistakes will be made, but we're sort of here to back you up, then you'll get a very different culture, right? Yeah. And, and and so many 
companies are are kind of unable to shift Un- their culture yeah. and get out of their own way. Yeah. You've had tons of experiences with this, I'm yeah. sure. What is that about? And what's an example yeah. of have shifted culture and been successful at that? Yeah. Well, I think my favorite large scale example of a cultural shift with wild benefit is Microsoft. Mm. So Microsoft before Satya Nadella was like, I think the prior CEO, maybe the value of the company at the beginning of his tenure was the same as the, at the end of his tenure. Yeah. And now look at, yeah. yeah, And now look at what happened with Satya and he changed the culture completely Mm. into all of the ways that you would want empowerment and trust, growth mindset, intelligent failure, like all of the things did all of the things. So to me, we have maybe before then we just people thought that that's some, you know, unproven methodology. But now the most successful companies are exhibiting these traits. So I expect them to be more contagious. Mm. Back then, companies, even if they weren't successful, we seduced ourselves into thinking, you know, tough guys finish first and shouting shows my, and Scott Galloway is really wonderful at saying, shouting shows my masculinity and right. I'm going to shout. And that's like not at all the, what masculinity is. <laughs> masculinity is like a beautiful thing where we're taking care of other people and setting the conditions for them to thrive. Um, so it's a, a reinterpretation of what great looks like. And I think we now have lots of lots of successful turnarounds. I would say that Walmart today versus Walmart yesterday, another what I guess we would call an old economy business that is so progressive in what it's doing, is doing development at a faster pace than most other organizations. And they have 100,000 employees in the US and mm-hmm. they are using AI and beautiful ways to empower and develop people in really progressive ways. So I don't think you, I don't think you have to be new economy or old economy to do it, but it does require leadership. Yeah. Doug McMillan, Satya Nadella, these are, I think you could have them lead any company and those companies will be successful. Yeah, so true. So I want to come back to this idea of human capital management, right? Much of our work has focused on um, helping companies design a human capital management strategy that sort of works for them in a systemic way to help them identify the right people, put them in the right roles at the right time, et cetera, through talent assessment, you know, organizational design and team design, but then also coaching where it's necessary. Yeah. And most companies in our experience do not think cohesively about that continuum of sort of recruiting, selection, you know, being really clear about people's roles in a team. Are they aligned with one another? And then gathering feedback, ensuring accountability, and then coaching for skills where necessary. Give us a couple of examples of companies that are actually getting this right. Yeah. You know, it might well be that they've worked with you in order to get it right, (laughs) meeting this sort of holistic design. But um, I'd I'd be really curious. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you my favorite current day example, which is one that surprisingly few people have studied, but I believe the entire world is going to know them in just a minute. And that's ServiceNow. Mm. So ServiceNow is in the land of tech companies. They have had faster growth by some measures than any of the other top growth companies that we have heard of. Mm-hmm. They're just under the radar with it. Their, ta- their approach to talent, Jackie Canney is just a world-class uh, head of human resources, head of people, which is a better word for it. Um, but the whole Bill McDermott, the CEO and others, the whole world really thinks systematically about it. So for example, in tech, everyone had layoffs over the last few years, right? I mean, and it was like super painful in the beginning and now it's commonplace. Everybody had layoffs except ServiceNow. Mm. 
And it's not that they sacrificed growth in order to do it, but they could read the tea leaves early. So they knew when to slow down hiring. They mm -hmm. knew how to have career paths for people. They knew how to shift people. So they now get like a million applications for a thousand roles. Word is getting out. One of the top places to work, mm -hmm. explosive growth, explosive profitability, because they do everything you just said with intention. They do it with intention. And so you have to be super smart, yes, but honestly, it's the difference between doing it with intention and doing it without intention, doing it as a priority and doing it without a priority. And what I like about making public, and so I try to be evangelical about the ones that are doing it well, so that other people realize it's possible and that you can do the set of things you just said. And people are like, well, how do you know? Go look at ServiceNow and be mesmerized by what you're seeing. And it's not magic dust. It's doing these things systematically. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think the intentionality and 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 systematizing it are, are the battle. Everything. Or, or the answer. In the end. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, Francis, I want to go back to the last question I asked you at the beginning when we started, which was watching the deer eat. <laughs> so, how did that start? Um, you know, the algorithms on YouTube, I don't know what's behind them, um, uh, but I will admit that I probably dwelled a little too long on some pet themed <laughs> Uh, and some animal themed things. And so they probably caught my dwell time and they just served up a set of things. And I might have been watching live videos of <laughs> hawks in Africa and, you know, and so they served up the, this deer pantry in, in Maine. And I just, it has everything I love. One, it helps like, Everybody needs help. I've known of no one that's been successful, including Michael Jordan, all the way down. Nobody's been successful without help. Well, these deer need help, and they're deer that are in the wild, yeah. um, but they need help in the winter months. And so right. they have systematically set up a way to feed them in the winter months without sacrificing any of their awesome dearness. Um, and they have multiple Pretty cameras, cool. but it's really cool. And the kids do it and they put out apples and you get to do, it's just, I love it. So now that you, you, I've said it to you, allow some time because you won't believe what you see. Some of the deer have been coming back for 10 years. Wow. The community has named the deer and you get to see them and see how they evolve over time. And then you get to see their offspring. It's really, it's quite amazing. So it has kind of everything I love. Okay. That's a, that's a really good, you've, you've captured it in a <laughs> nutshell, I think. <laughs> yeah. So Francis, any parting thoughts as you sort of think about the conversation we just had? Yeah, I think that the, the one thing I would emphasize is the importance of coaching. Mm. And and coaching and teaching, these are, these are things where we want to get disproportionate, you know, non-incremental gains out of people. And it is really hard to do this leadership stuff as a solo sport. Yeah. We need peripheral vision. And I think having a coach is a pretty amazing way to have peripheral vision. And so my parting thought is don't try to go it alone. There's no reason to. And there are people who have devoted their lives to being helpful to others, uh, partner with them. Absolutely. Well, you, I couldn't have said it better myself. So <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's such a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe wherever you listen and leave us a review. Find your ideal coach at www.vidmx.com. Special thanks to our producer, Martin Maluski and singer-songwriter, Doug Allen. <laughs>